Okay, I want to reset where we are. We're studying the book of Job. And let me reset the situation, the setting. In chapter 1, we're informed that Job is blameless and upright, or innocent and virtuous, it's sometimes translated. One who fears God and turns away from evil. And that's a description that is twice affirmed as true directly by God. So we can take that to the bank. It is a fact that Job is a paragon of faithfulness. He's the epitome of a godly wise man. His cup overflows with blessings of children and livestock and servants. See, which is perfectly in keeping with the notion that you see in various places in the Old Testament that rewards and blessings come to those who live righteously and suffering and punishment comes to those who are wicked. See, everything there is, it fits just with that. Everything at that point is copacetic. But then the story takes this challenging turn as the scene moves to the heavenly realm. And Satan there, he tells God that he's been prowling the earth. And he's doing that, no doubt, seeking to expose as hypocrites all of God's supposedly faithful servants. And God identifies Job to Satan as the real deal. The supreme example of a truly pious, God-fearing human. In other words, unbeknownst to Job and unbeknownst to anybody else on earth, Job is chosen by God to be the standard bearer of human commitment and devotion to God. He's chosen by God to be mankind's champion against the claim that all humans are at bottom pretenders, that all humans ultimately serve only themselves. And Satan responds to God's recommendation of Job with the accusation that that Job serves God only from self-interest, only because God pays him to do so by granting him wealth and blessings. And he proposes to prove that God's confidence in Job, and thus his confidence in any human being, that his confidence in Job is misplaced by declaring that Job will curse God to his face That Job will terminate their relationship if God takes away the things that he has. And so God expresses his confidence in Job by permitting Satan to take away all the things he has, meaning his livestock, his servants, and his children, which Satan promptly proceeds to do. But Job remains faithful to God as expressed in those famous words in Job chapter 1, verse 20 to 22. In chapter 2, Satan claims that the test wasn't extreme enough because it only affected external things, the things that Job had. It didn't affect Job's own body and health. And God again expresses his confidence in Job by permitting Satan to strike his body and his health, but he forbids him to take his life. And Satan promptly strikes Job with these painful sores or boils all over his body from head to foot. Job chapter 2 verses 7 to 10 shows that Job maintained his loyalty to God in face of even physical suffering. Now though the physical suffering was only short term at that point. It had only been, he'd only been enduring it for a little while. He's continuing faithfulness through even that short-term physical suffering that suggests or anticipates his continuing faithfulness through his prolonged physical suffering. His prolonged physical suffering, as I said last week, it produces some cracks and some great emotional struggle, leading Job to say some things about God for which he later repents. But through it all, through even the prolonged physical suffering, he doesn't renounce or abandon God. 
And thus Satan's claim that Job would curse God to his face, terminate their relationship, that claim remains disproved throughout the course of the book. But as I said last week, after chapter 2, verse 10, the focus of the book shifts. It shifts from Job's motivation for his relationship with God, whether he was loyal to God because he was paid well, it shifts to the question raised by the, by the test of that motivation. So it shifts from his motivation to the question raised by the test of that motivation. That is the question of human suffering. Now what's really on display from chapter 2 verse 11 forward is mankind's attempt to make sense of human suffering. And that attempt raises implicitly an even more basic question. This attempt to make sense of human suffering raises the basic question of where does true wisdom reside? Where does true wisdom reside? The insight into how things really function. The insight into how this reality is really structured. The insight that allows one to live skillfully, successfully in this world. Where does that in wisdom truly reside? Job and his friends, they all lay claim to wisdom. They are wisdom teachers. They all lay claim to wisdom, to true insight into the matter of Job's suffering. But as the book is going to suggest, all human assessments... All human efforts at wisdom must remain subject to the wisdom above. You see, reasoning from experience and observation can, when divorced from special revelation addressing the specific situation, it can easily get off track. So in the absence of a special revelation dealing with a particular situation, we have to explore wisdom with humility. We have to hold our conclusions about what is the true nature of how things operate. What is wisdom? We have to hold those conclusions loosely. We can discern things. We can do that. We can find our way to wisdom. And you can see that because if you look at Egyptian proverbs, for example, you see how some of them are very close to the Proverbs that we have in Scripture. So God has structured this reality that you and I can, through observation and experience, reason our way to wisdom about how this place is structured, but we are finite. And in the absence of special revelation, we are prone to misperception. And we have to keep that in mind as we seek to understand reality. Now, when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, when they heard of this great hardship that had come upon Job, they agreed to meet together and then to go to Job to sympathize with and comfort him, as you see in verse 11. And this suggests that they may have come to Job more like a team, you see, more like three individuals who share a common viewpoint or perspective. And that seems to be the case in the speeches that they deliver later. Now, by this time, Job's been suffering for quite a while. We don't know how long, but he's been suffering for quite a while. Indeed, he was so ravaged by his affliction that they didn't even recognize him. He was so chewed up by the suffering, the physical suffering he was undergoing, they didn't recognize him when they approached him, as you see in verse 12. And the friends, they cried, they tore their robes, they sprinkled dust on their heads, you see, all of which were cultural signs of sorrow and mourning. And they then sat with Job on the ground for seven days and seven nights, without saying a word because they saw how greatly Job was suffering. And there's a clue there, by the way. 
about approaching people who are truly in suffering. You may have many wise, correct answers, but there are times when people's suffering is so raw that there's nothing you can say to them. You, it, it, for you to come in at certain points and start trying to teach or do these things, there are times when the only appropriate response is to sit with sufferers in silence. And you see that from these friends. So whatever criticism can fairly be leveled at these three friends, let's not forget the compassion that they show Job here. Now in Job's complaint in chapter 3, the prose narrative, the first two chapters are prose, non-poetry, but there, here in chapter 3, the prose narrative, it gives way to poetry. And usually in English translations, you see that because it'll be indented. And this poetry continues with a little sprinkling of prose in there. But it continues all the way into chapter 42. And this shift in literary form, it corresponds to this shift in focus from the test of motivation to the question of suffering. In the first 10 verses here, Job, he curses the day of his birth, wishing he could obliterate it from the record of days. And he goes on in the rest of the chapter there to lament his birth. The fact he didn't die at birth, didn't die or at birth or in the womb, and thereby avoid all this misery that he is experiencing. And he's not speaking to anyone at this particular point. He's simply venting. He's venting his deepest feelings and thoughts because Job is absolutely going through the ringer. And notice that it's Job who breaks the silence. It's Job who breaks the silence by complaining bitterly about his situation. This isn't like the laments that one reads in Psalms, for example, in Psalms 88, or one sees in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 20, for example, which are, those are addressed to God. And they include some ray of hope. That's not how these are. There's a difference in bringing cries of our suffering to God and grumbling about it to other people with, with no, hope, no sense of hope. As Tremper Longman says in his commentary, he says, Job speaks more like the Israelites in the wilderness who grumble against God than the psalmist who brings his laments before God. This distinction helps us to understand why the three friends feel they must speak out now against Job. And so begins chapter 4. Now, I think the obscurity of chapter 3, verse 8, well, I've underlined there that little phrase, calls for some comment. This creature, this beast, Leviathan, is a great, magnificent sea creature, perhaps an extinct sea creature. But you see him described in Job chapter 41. But Leviathan, he's some great, tremendous sea creature that as embellished in pagan mythology came to embody the forces of chaos and destruction that were overcome at creation. This creature that God had made came in pagan mythology to symbolize those forces of chaos and destruction. And Job plays off that culturally familiar sense in chapter 3, verse 8, See, after calling on the experts at delivering curses, he wants the day of his birth to be cursed, to be obliterated. And after calling on experts at cursing, see, it would be somebody like we would think of Balaam, for example. After calling on these experts at delivering curses to curse the day of his birth, he then refers to them as those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. In other words, these experts at cursing, he's calling on, they're ready to unleash that, that, that kind of destructive force for Job's purpose of eradicating the day of his birth. 
So that's what with this Leviathan thing, I'm sure when you're looking at it, you're going, what's that? There's a footnote on what's going on with that. Now, we go to chapter 4, and chapter 4, it begins the cycles that I mentioned last week, the cycles of, or dialogues or speeches, and it's a so-called debate. And it has four participants. Elihu comes in later. But you have Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Job. So you have four participants in the debate, in the debate but you really only have two principal perspectives. Four participants, but really only two principal perspectives. There's that of Job on the one hand, and the perspective of his three friends on the other. In other words, the three friends give variations on a single take on the situation, namely that Job's suffering is a consequence of his sin. And therefore, the path to relief is repentance. That's their song. They're going to sing this song in all kinds of different ways. But that is their dominant shared perspective. Job's suffering is a consequence of his sin. And therefore the path out of that suffering is for Job to repent. Job, on the other hand, he knows that's not the case. He knows that is not the case. He knows, as we know as readers, that he is genuinely devout. He is a paragon of faithfulness. Now, he's not sinless. No mere human is sinless. But there's nothing in his life that can account for the degree of suffering that he's experiencing. There is nothing in his life that can account for the extraordinary suffering to which he's been subjected. So Job concludes that God is being unjust toward him. God is treating him wrongly. Now the speeches that we'll see, they're not what would normally be considered a debate or a dialogue. Not only do they speak in poetry, okay, which is something to note, but the participants, they speak in turn. In other words, one guy goes, next guy goes, instead of, you know, this back and forth in the middle of the talk. Finish, start, finish, start, finish, start, finish. So not only are they speaking in poetry, but the participants speak in turn. And rather than engaging the arguments of the previous speaker point by point, I mean, they do that sometimes. But what they're typically doing is speaking in generalities, and they speak somewhat independently of what was said before. As I said last week, it's akin to politicians with talking points. You see, they will respond and say something, but they then go off and have their own thing they want to say. And you'll see this in the cycles of speeches. Now notice that Job and his friends, all of them, all four of them embrace what Tremper Longman and others call retribution theology. They all embrace this. In short, they share the conviction that rewards and blessings accompany righteous living and suffering and punishment accompany sinful living. Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Now, Job's friends, they conclude from that assumption or that conviction that Job's a sinner in need of repentance. They say there's this retribution theology, absolutist. Good things happen to good people, bad things to bad people. You're getting the hammer, therefore you are sinning. That is why you're getting the hammer. So that's what they conclude. And Job concludes that God is violating the principle and is therefore unjust. So, You see that despite this formidable gathering of wise men, these three men in Job, the truth eludes them. 
That's what I think. See, as you and I seek in this world for wisdom based on experience and observation, God has structured this world that we can land on wisdom, but apart from special revelation, we have to do so uh, humbly and hold our convictions loosely. Because here you see four wise men who wind up thinking they have the answer and they are, uh, the truth of it escapes them. The truth of it lies in the wisdom of God to which you and I as readers are privy. You see, he's, he's letting us in on it. And that's, that's a big message. That really is the message. Where does wisdom reside? You see? And that's, you'll see that I think as we unfold. All right. Chapter four and five, we get Eliphaz. So here they are all sitting in silence. Job then breaks out in this bitter complaint. And that then makes these three friends say, we can't remain silent any longer. And we have Eliphaz who speaks. Now, the fact he speaks first suggests that he's the leader. Perhaps he's the senior member. And he was an Edomite, as indicated by the fact the name Eliphaz. It's associated with Esau who's called Edom, and Teman, the place from which Eliphaz comes, that's also associated with Edom, a number of places, text in the Old Testament. Now, Eliphaz opens up here in verses 1 and 2, and he politely expresses his intention to challenge Job's complaint. See, which given the circumstances, given Job's suffering, he's not eager to do it. But he feels it's something... He has to do for Job's own good, if for nothing else. Then in verses 3 to 5, he compliments Job for having guided and strengthened others through the years. See, Job's a wise man. He compliments him for having guided and instructed other people uh, with his counsel and his instruction. And then he accuses Job of failing to bring that same wisdom to bear on his own situation. You've you've been able to help other people through the years, and now it's coming to you, and you won't apply the same thing that you have applied to other people. Now, Job had no doubt guided others in their suffering by applying the accepted wisdom of retribution theology, the notion that suffering is inevitably rooted in sinfulness and that repentance therefore is the key to relief. Job had applied that to people. And there were times right when that was what they needed. And so he had helped many people. But as Job's complaint made clear, as Eliphaz is looking at it, he refuses to apply that very same wisdom to his own situation and he therefore rejects the insight that would give him hope of restoration. The path to his restoration and healing is in what he has told other people. If he would simply heed it. And his refusal to take his own medicine. That leaves Job in despair. And then in chapter 4 verse 6. As with all people. Job's confidence and hope. Lie in his fearing God. And living faithfully. So those qualities, you see, form the path out of Job's darkness, according to Eliphaz. And then he says in 7 to 11, it's not that the innocent, it, it's not the innocent and the upright who die young, for example. You see, he, he doesn't see that. No, no, no. It's not the innocent and upright who die young, for example. It's those who plow iniquity. And those who sow trouble, who reap from God hardship and trouble. And he says that, look, though the wicked appear strong and invincible like lions, God will destroy them because of their evil. So this is what he's saying to Job. Now, of course, as a general principle, as a general principle, it is true that one will reap hardship from living sinfully. For example, Proverbs 22.8 says, Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. But it's a serious mistake 
to turn this into an absolute rule. And that false assumption that this is an absolute rule can turn a wise man into a blind guide, which is what we see happening in the book, in the book of Job. In verses uh, 12 to 17, Eliphaz, he recounts this eerie encounter with a spirit, a heavenly messenger of some kind who indicated by rhetorical questions that humans cannot be righteous and pure before Almighty God. And in sharing this, Eliphaz offers divine support for the claim that Job is a sinner. He's saying, look, this eerie spirit, this heavenly messenger has communicated this to me that there's no such thing as a sinless human being. And he's offering that. He says, so I have that. See, which sinfulness he implies, Eliphaz, he implies that's the explanation for Job's suffering. And then he adds in verses 18 to 21, he adds in 18 to 21, that if even spiritual beings, if even they have proven untrustworthy, they've shown that they are not above sinning as in the case of fallen angels. Well, then certainly mere human beings are guilty of sin, right? And that's what he's saying to Job. Now, but as Job will indicate later, Job will indicate in chapter 9, he's not sinless, that's not the point. The point is, he's innocent of anything that would justify what he's going through. You see, I mean, the claim is not sinlessness. He is a paragon of faithfulness, but he's a sinner. All mere humans are sinners. So that's really beside the point. Yet you see Eliphaz kind of lagging it out there. You see, as though that's somehow relevant to the situation. Now Eliphaz then says in chapter 5, verse 1, that no one on earth or in heaven is on Job's side in thinking that his suffering is undeserved. He doesn't have any allies anywhere in buying that. See, from the perspective of Eliphaz's absolutist retribution theology, there are no exceptions or aberrations in God's neatly run cosmos. He functions this way, you are suffering, ergo, you are sinning. You are suffering exceptionally, therefore you are sinning exceptionally. This is, this is how it is. This is how he views things. Now, alluding to the irritation act and the jealousy of other people's lives that's reflected in Job's complaint. Job has this sense of irritation of other people's lives, a sense of jealousy toward them. And alluding to that, Eliphaz in chapter 5, verse 2 he gives a general proverb or principle indicating that these negative emotions are hallmarks of the foolish. They're hallmarks of the foolish. He then notes in 3 to 5 that such people, the fool, can flourish for a time. Nobody denies that. The fool can flourish for a time only to have what? Their lives turn disastrous. They can blossom, but then they're wiped out. Well, does that sound like anybody? It sounds like Job. You see? Their lives turn disastrous. Their children are killed. Hmm, that sounds familiar. And they lose their harvest and their wealth. So yes, a fool. Yeah, Job, you can look good for a while. But stuff catches up to you. And justice is done. Okay, so now, misery and hardship, he says in, in five... In, Verse, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Misery and hardship have a cause. There is something that produces them. They don't pop out of thin air. Indeed, they're abundant. Misery and hardship, these things are abundant because humanity is born for trouble in the sense the foolish actions that result in misery and hardship come naturally to us. They come naturally. See, foolishness, the lack of fear of God, that seems to be humanity's default mode. These things come naturally to us. 
If he were in Job's shoes, he says in verse 8, he would seek God and commit himself to him. In other words, he would repent. If I were, in, if I were you, I'd turn back to God. That's what you need to do. He would do so, he says in, in verses 9 to 16, because of the great and marvelous things that God does within nature and among human beings. So it's the idea, I would do that because of the magnificence of the God we serve. That's what I would do. I would repent in light of who God is. And that's what he's saying that Job should do. Now Eliphaz says in, in 17 to 26 of chapter 5, he says that suffering as discipline for sin, that's really a blessing because if the intended lesson is received, meaning if repentance is forthcoming, well, then it produces healing. And when the relationship with God is healed, one comes under the safety and the blessings that God, pursuant to retribution theology, pours out invariably on the righteous. So once that, sit, that relationship is healed, you now come become a recipient of all the good things that God invariably pours out on the righteous. It will then be all roses for you. Everything will be fine if you will just repent and turn to God. And again, there's truth in that as a general proposition. You see it in Proverbs, Hebrews 12, 4 to 11, about discipline and how it is a blessing in that it alerts people and draws them to repentance that they need. But as Tremper Longman says, Eliphaz's mistake is not in the principle, but in believing that it's always true. And in particular, that it's true in the case of Job. It is not true in the case of Job. That's why, see, at the very beginning, that was nailed down. We know it's not true in the case of Job. And that's part of what drives the story. That's what drives it. Now he ends, Eliphaz ends in verse 27, ends his speech by declaring that they've searched it out and it's true and he urges Job to heed it for his own good. So that's the contribution, the first volley that we get from Eliphaz. And then in chapter 6 and 7, Job speaks, and Job says that if his ang anguish, in verses 1 to 4, he says that if his anguish and his misery could be placed on a scale, they'd outweigh all the sand of the seashore. Now, this guy's getting the hammer. This guy's getting it. That's why he spoke without res restraint. It was forced out of him. By the magnitude of his suffering, in Job's mind, God is at war with him. God is an enemy. He's at war with him, inflicting his spirit with deadly arrows. God has a bullseye on Job. That's what Job is feeling, and it should come as no surprise, he says in verses 5 to 7, should come as no surprise that he brays and bellows. After all, the donkey and the ox, the donkey and the ox, they do that when they lack food. And Job analogously lacks any sustenance from life. What do the donkey and ox do when they're lacking? <laughs> so why does it surprise you that in my tremendous suffering that I am doing this? All of Job's life. Every experience, none of it's providing him any sustenance. All, the, all that life is serving him is tasteless and inedible experiences that are sickening and repulsive. And he longs for God, in verses 8 to 10, he longs for God to finish him off. To put him out of his misery. He doesn't consider taking his own life as that would be a betrayal of God. But if God would take his life, he would take comfort or, in, or consolation in knowing that in spite of unsparing pain, he didn't deny the words of the Holy One. See, if God would take his life, 
He would die without having betrayed God. Now, you have to know how this is driving the other three guys crazy. See, when he says this, this grates on them because they're convinced he's a secret sinner. And that's the explanation. And so when he says this kind of stuff, they're going, I'm going to get you. You see, I'm going to wind up exposing you. And Job says, verses 11 to 13, that he has, he has no strength to hold on. He has no hope of restoration to inspire him to make plans for future life. No strength like that of stone or bronze that would allow him to resist his pummeling. And he has no one to help him. See, his resolve, his inner strength has been driven from him. As Longman says, Job is in a deep fix, but he sees no way out. Can, can you put yourself in Job's position and just imagine what Job is enduring and what he's going through? In verses 14 to 23 of chapter 6, Job accuses the friends of disloyalty to him. See, which ultimately is disloyalty to God because God expects friends to exhibit loyalty. And by loyalty, he means the type of love that God characteristically shows his people. Love that issues in protection and help in times of trouble. From Job's perspective, they're attacking rather than protecting him. They're intensifying rather than minimizing his suffering. And thus they're not showing a proper attitude of fear toward God. He compares these friends to a stream. One was confident would provide refreshment. You're in a desert area. You have this idea, over here is a stream that will give us refreshment. And he's, he's comparing them to that kind of stream that one had confidence would provide refreshment, but it turned out to be dry when it was needed. So when you finally got over to this thing that you were confident would provide refreshment, it turned out to be just a major, major disappointment. And the shame... You see, shame for lack of foresight. The shame for this uh, false trust in this stream. The shame and the disappointment that overconfident travelers felt when realizing the stream was dry. That's what Job felt with his friends. That's what he says in 15 to 20. He says that when they saw his condition... In 21 to 23, when they saw his condition, they were afraid he might expect something from them. When they saw how he was suffering, how he was being getting the hammer, well, they were concerned that he might expect something from them, like wealth, or to have them intervene on his behalf with some foe. But he says he expected nothing but loyalty, which in his case didn't require any of those things. And Job, he calls the friends to help him understand, verse 24, what he's done wrong as Eliphaz. Eliphaz is saying, listen, come on, man, repent. Fess up. We know. And he calls them. He says, listen here. You know, help me understand. Show me. Convict me of the wrong that Eliphaz is talking about. And he rebukes them in verse 25 for their words they think are so virtuous, but which in reality are painful, and fail to make the case that Job has done wrong. If you're going to claim that, pony up the evidence. Pony up something that will convict me of it. Don't just that, did you wrong, wrong, wrong. Show me. That's what he wants from them. And in verse 26 and 27, they blow off his words. See, the complaints of a despairing man that his suffering is not right. Which to Job, that suggests that they're the type of people who would take advantage of an orphan or sell out a friend. And so Job's not very happy 
with their response. But he says in 28 and 29, despite their failure, he's willing to give them another chance. And he urges them there in 28 and 29 to question him, to investigate this sense of innocence that he has and that he's claiming. Investigate it rather than simply assume from his suffering that he's sinful. He urges them to investigate. He says, I'll tell you the truth. Go ahead. Let's have a sit down. Let's have whatever you want. Bring in all the investigators you want. I'll tell you the truth about my life and situation. He indicates by the rhetorical question of verse 30 that he's able to know the true nature of his calamity in the sense of knowing that it's not due to his sin. He knows that for sure. He lives in here. He's with himself all the time. And he knows for a fact the kind of person that he is. But the parties, as we will see throughout this, they will continue their wisdom battle in terms of a false dichotomy. They're going to continue this battle in terms of a false dichotomy. Job is sinful or God is wrong. And that's how it's going to go. And that is all spawned by their shared absolutist retribution theology. 7, 1 to 10. Job, he speaks in utter despair of the suffering, the futility and the brevity of his life. His nights are torture. He's like a walking corpse complete with flesh covered with flesh that's covered by sores, worms, dirt. Reminds me of my brother. But I mean, he's just he's just like here. You can just see him. He's just tormented with this and because of his dire and hopeless situation, he says in verse 11 that he's not going to restrain himself. He's not going to restrain himself. He's going to speak out. He's going to speak in the full bitterness of his soul. And then he, he then accuses God of having him on lockdown. Like he's some kind of great hostile force. Like the sea or a sea monster. He accuses God of terrorizing him. And making his life miserable. And he complains that God will not look away from him for a moment. Will not give him a moment of peace or rest. You see in 12 to 19. And Job ends this round of his words. He ends this round by declaring in chapter 7 verse 20. Through rhetorical questions. That regardless of whether he sinned, that second bell? Yeah. Oh, you, yeah. Woo. All right, let me say this, and then I'll have a nice stopping point. Just take a second. Hold tight. He ends it in 720 that through this rhetorical questions he asked that regardless of whether he sinned, it can't warrant the level of punishing attention that God's devoting to him. And he asked in verse 21 why God doesn't simply forgive him rather than subject him to such extreme suffering. And the implication of that is that God is intent on punishing him, that God has it in for him. That's how he sees God. And he ends by declaring that he will soon be dead and gone. He feels that. Okay, we'll pick back up there, Lord willing, next week. Thanks for coming.